I know those servo contact brakes have been on our cars for better than two years, Tech. But I haven't worked on brakes much lately. And besides, there are a lot of things about these brakes that you've never explained. For instance, why are the linings on this front shoe shorter than on the rear shoe? And why does the longer rear lining wear faster? Well, I'll plead guilty to that, Smitty. There are some things I haven't told you master technicians about how servo contact brakes work. But today, I've got a real brake expert to help me fill you all in. So crank up your thinkers and keep your eyes and ears open for the next 20 minutes or so. Red and I are going to give Smitty the inside dope on these brakes and pass along a few tips on trouble diagnosis and service. Are you ready, Red? Ready, Tech. As you all know, this brake has one hydraulic cylinder with two pistons, one to actuate each shoe. When there's no hydraulic force on the pistons, the shoes are held against the anchor on the backing plate by the return springs. At the end opposite the cylinder, the front or primary shoe is connected to the rear or secondary shoe through a floating adjuster. This floating arrangement gives us what is called self-energizing action. Here's how it works. When you step on the brake pedal, the wheel cylinder pistons force the shoes out against the drum. Because of the frictional force between the linings and the drum, both shoes tend to move around with the drum. The top end of the secondary shoe is immediately forced against the anchor, which prevents the shoe from moving farther. Then, the turning force on the primary shoe is transmitted through the adjuster to the bottom of the secondary shoe. This is called self-energizing force. It forces the secondary shoe out against the drum using the anchor as a pivot point. The rear piston exerts a force on the secondary shoe too, but the hydraulic force is a whole lot less than the self-energizing force from the primary shoe. Right, Tech. Actually, the primary shoe does only a fraction of the braking. The secondary shoe does most of the job. The primary shoe's main function in forward braking is to energize the secondary shoe. Because of the different brake shoe functions, there's a big difference between the primary and secondary lining material. The primary lining has relatively high friction characteristics. The high friction gives the primary shoe a greater tendency to turn with the drum and transmit a high force to the secondary shoe. The secondary lining is a low friction material. It's designed to do much more braking and yet last about as long as the primary lining. I see. That would seem to explain why the primary lining is shorter. You're probably oversimplifying a bit, Smitty, but essentially that's right. Remember, though, some 11-inch brakes have long primary linings. That's one good reason to watch the color code so you don't mix or mismatch the linings. You can get into all kinds of trouble by installing wrong shoes or getting them in the wrong place. For instance, if the shoes were reversed, the low friction secondary lining would give you less self-energizing force. The primary lining in the secondary position would wear out very fast because it would be called on to handle most of the braking. If you put two secondary linings on the same wheel, the braking ability of that wheel would be very poor. The lower friction lining for the primary wouldn't energize the secondary shoe as much as it should. Two primary linings on the same wheel would make the brakes grabby, and the secondary lining wouldn't last long. That clears up several things I wondered about. But tell me, do the brakes work the same backing up as going forward? Just about, Smitty, except that the action of the shoes is reversed. When backing up, the secondary piston controls the amount of braking. The secondary shoe energizes the primary shoe, which does most of the braking. I see. Now, while we're talking about reverse, tell me about the automatic adjusters. They work when you back up, right? Right, Smitty. When you're braking in reverse, the secondary shoe moves away from the anchor and pulls the adjuster cable. The lining to drum clearance determines how far the shoe moves and how far the cable is pulled. 
If there's enough clearance from lining wear, the cable pulls the adjuster lever far enough to engage the next notch in the star wheel. Then, when the brake is released, the lever snaps back and turns the star wheel. This lengthens the adjuster, which decreases drum to lining clearance and maintains correct pedal height. And here's an important point to remember. When you're putting one of these jobs together, the adjuster stamped R goes on the right side and the adjuster marked L goes on the left. If you mix them up, the drum to lining clearance will increase instead of decrease, causing low pedal. The pitch of the adjuster's screw threads for the 9 and 10 inch brakes isn't the same as for the 11 inch brake, so don't interchange them either. The reference book tells you how to identify the adjusters. I'll remember that, fellas. Now, are you going to give me any tips on diagnosing troubles? You bet we are, Smitty. Let's start with brake pull. Of course, you know that pull isn't always the fault of the brakes. Improper front end alignment, a loose lower control arm strut, or a loose wheel bearing or backing plate can all cause pull. And don't forget a sagging front or rear suspension. And the most common one of all, a low tire. Isn't pull often caused by unequal adjustment, too? Not on your life, Smitty. With hydraulic brakes, unequal adjustment almost never causes pull. Here's why. In a hydraulic brake system, the same pressure is applied to all the wheel cylinder pistons. Since the pistons on opposite sides of the car have equal areas, the hydraulic force available for braking is equal on the right and left sides. Even if one piston has to travel farther because of more lining clearance, it still exerts the same force on its shoe as the corresponding piston on the opposite wheel, Smitty. There's one exception to this rule. If a brake line is pinched, it can act as an orifice. Then pressure application at one cylinder will be delayed. But you wouldn't call this unequal adjustment. Tech's right, Smitty. Now, pull usually comes from something causing different friction on opposite sides of the car. Differences in friction can be caused by unmatched linings, lining glaze, lining contamination, or differences in drum finish. You can check for unmatched linings by the color codes. The color codes are in the chart in the reference book. Linings get glazed from too much heat. A dragging shoe is likely to become glazed. Also, burning in new linings or prolonged riding the brakes downhill will glaze the linings. You correct glazed linings by sanding or scuffing with 60 or 80 grit emery paper. Be sure the linings on both sides of the car have the same finish when you're done. Differences in drum finish are handled the same way. Sand the drums with 60 or 80 grit emery paper. If the pull is caused by brake fluid, grease, or oil on the lining, find the cause and fix it, and always replace the lining. There's no way to save a contaminated lining, so don't try. Here's how to spot a couple of causes of lining contamination. Anytime you have a drum off, pull back the wheel cylinder boots at the bottom and look for fluid under them. If you can see fluid, the cylinder needs rebuilding. If someone is too generous with wheel bearing grease, the grease gets forced out past the inner seal when the wheels turn. If you find wheel bearing grease on the backing plate, you won't have any trouble telling what ruined the lining. And you won't have any trouble telling what ruined the needle if someone doesn't turn the record over. Now that the needle has been rescued from ruin, Red, suppose you expound a little on dragging brakes. Okay, Tech. One major cause of shoe drag is rough platforms on the brake backing plate. As you know, the platforms act as guides for the shoes to prevent cocking and damp out noise. If a brake shoe loop hangs up on a rough platform, the shoe won't return when the pedal is released. To correct this condition, remove the shoes and dress down the platforms with fine emery cloth. Also, be sure and remove any rough edges or sharp corners from the shoe loops with a fine file 
Be careful not to remove too much metal from any of the loops. If you file too much off one loop, you lose contact between that loop and its platform and end up with brake noise. Right, Tech. Before you reinstall the shoes, apply a thin coat of Mopar or Crico Silglide to the platforms. Just be careful not to use too much, or it might get on the linings. Okay, I'll watch it. Now, here's something I don't understand. I've heard that it's possible for self-adjusters to over-adjust. How could this happen? During a very severe high-speed stop, the brake drums heat up and expand. Then, if the car is backed up immediately while the drums are expanded, the automatic adjusters readjust the brakes for the expanded drum diameter. Then, when the drums cool, the shoes drag. That answers my question about over-adjustment. What's next? Why not tell Smitty about brake chatter now, Red? There are several possible causes of chatter. One thing to check for is a loose backing plate. This usually causes pull, noise, and erratic braking, too. If the backing plates are tight, see that the wheel stud nuts are torqued properly. The wrong torque or wrong tightening order often distorts the drum and causes chatter. If the brakes still chatter after proper torquing, the chatter is probably caused by surface irregularities in the drum. In this case, the chatter will be most noticeable during relatively light applications at high speeds. The chatter usually stops at speeds below 40 miles an hour. You can correct this problem by resurfacing the front drums on a brake drum grinder, not on a lathe. Why not a lathe? Well, you have very little material to remove. The irregularities are frequently smaller than you can measure. If you set a lathe to take a light cut, the tool tends to follow the irregularities instead of making a true cut. I see. But say, you said grind the front drums. What about the rear? The rear drums seldom cause brake chatter complaints, Smitty. Here's why. At the rear, the suspension damps out vibrations, so rear brake noise isn't a common problem. What's more, the front brakes handle 60% of the braking load. Another cause of chatter is a heat-spotted drum. Heat spots are extremely hard areas on the drum surface caused by overheating in severe stops. Heat spot chatter is easy to tell from drum surface irregularity chatter. With heat spots, you get a harsh, low-speed chatter, as low as 20 miles an hour. During braking at higher speeds, heat spots cause a rumbling noise. Heat spots are very hard, so the drums have to be ground to correct the problem. A lathe would make matters worse. Now, there are some other brake noises we should talk about. Shoe knock or shoe slap is caused by a poor lathe finish on the drum. It usually shows up on the left side. If a threading condition is created by the cutting tool, the resulting threading action pulls the shoes on the left side away from the backing plate when the brakes are applied. Then, the hold down spring snaps the shoe back against the backing plate, causing the knock. Do you have to machine the drums to cure the shoe knock? Nope. Break up the threads by vigorous sanding with 60 or 80 grit emery paper. Now, Red, you better tell Smitty about shoe scrape, too. Shoe scrape occasionally shows up in the left rear brake of Plymouth or Dodge. It's caused by the secondary shoe moving out and rubbing against the drum during braking. This is easy to spot because it causes an interference mark at the end of the shoe. Fix it by installing an extra hold-down spring retainer for more hold-down force. Now, here's another noise problem. A low-pitched howling front brake that's usually loudest in a turn is caused by the shoe rubbing on the center platform. If you find this problem, you'll have to dress off the center platform below the others. Well, that complete procedure is in the reference book. Now, before we run out of time, Red, why don't you quickly review the precautions for servicing these brakes? Glad to, Tech. Keep the hydraulic system clean. Don't let contamination in when you add fluid. Never use any fluid but Chrysler or Crico high-temp fluid. 
Assemble the hydraulic system carefully and keep the connections tight to prevent leaks. Of course, never pinch a brake line. And don't put a lot of twist in the brake hoses, or they might rub against some part of the car and wear through. Treat the linings like a new baby to prevent contamination. Don't even get dirty fingerprints on them. Lubricate brake parts sparingly and carefully. Don't use an excessive amount of bearing lube because the excess has a way of finding a brake lining to soak into. And any time you spot a lube leak that could ruin the linings, correct it promptly. Always match the linings correctly and use only approved linings. Consult the reference book chart any time you're in doubt. And here's something to remember about new linings. New Chrysler or Crico shoe and lining assemblies are ground under the drum diameter so there'll be heel and toe clearance. Without this clearance, there'd be noise and instability. There's a run-in period when contact is on the center part of the lining only. That's why severe stops can damage new lining by scuffing or bleeding out of black friction particles. You can't burn new linings in. You can only burn them up. It takes a hundred or more normal stops to wear the lining in properly. Don't try to burn them in with a few severe stops. Now, uh, tell Smitty about drum service, Red. Brake drums need to be handled with care, too. Never hit or drop a drum or it may get distorted. This could cause chatter or pedal pulsation. Remember, when you're machining a drum, it should be bolted to a car wheel or to a metal plate, and the stud nuts must be properly torqued. The equipment has to be in good condition for accurate work. For example, a loose tool holder can allow the tool to bounce or follow existing irregularities. And, of course, never enlarge the drum more than 60 thousandths over standard drum diameter. That means Never remove more than 30 thousandths of drum material. How'd I do, Tech? You did right well, Red. And I'm sure Smitty and all the other master technicians out there got some good information from this session. And remember, men, everything Red told you and more is in the reference book. Keep it and study it. Good brake service is mighty important. When you have a brake job, don't do it any way but the right way.